Hey guys, this is Tracy Pelfrey. Let's get to it. These are some more random clips, part two. Man, I know, now I know it's not me because you're sleeping already and I haven't started yet. <laughs> you should wake up your mind and ask God to forgive you. If you were in medieval times, they would come and put one of those brass bronze helmets on you. That now see, you could say, well, this is just, he's just messing around. No, we already know he's not. Because almost every service, he gets on the followers for not, not responding the way he wants. I mean, seriously, what... How, how does the normal person walking around think of this? And we know how upset he gets when they don't do what he wants. But that their mind goes to that, to shaming. And why would his first thought be that people need to be shamed with a medieval torture device over their head? Go read up on a scold's bridle. And make you walk around signaling to the, all the public. You talk about virtue signaling. That's vice signaling. You know, people who wear the mask to show everybody how compliant and awesome they are. So he's saying instead of virtue signaling with a cloth mask during a pandemic, he's saying your vice is you're not staying awake and you need to have one of these on your head. But back then, shaming was an effective deterrent that kept society in control. But back then, shaming was an effective deterrent that kept society in control. Let's hear that again, because lately, NTCC leaders are just saying stuff right out there. They don't even hide it. He's telling you, shaming was an effective tool in medieval times, effective medieval. Who thinks of anything during medieval times as having been good? Most of the things that come to your mind are not like, oh, let's go to medieval times and watch a show and, and eat a big, huge leg of chicken and have some potatoes on the side. It's not that. This is real stuff. People were really, it wasn't just shaming. It was beyond that. It was torture. For anyone to use the word effective with a torture device, something's wrong with them. Something is really, really wrong. And we've seen in previous videos that I've, I've posted recently that uh, Kekko for sure uses shaming as a tool, as a device to keep you compliant. He uses it all the time. If you're late, you're shamed. If you don't laugh at a joke, you're shamed. There's every dumb reason to be shamed in this guy's mind. This man talks about people having a grudge if they don't laugh at his jokes. I shared that video recently. But back then, shaming was an effective deterrent that kept society in control. And it has been the way that this group has kept their society under control, beginning with Davis, who was the master humiliator. You don't like this message already, do you? <laughs> it's okay, well, I'm not a PC-compliant preacher. I don't preach for the government. I... <laughs> I preach for the God that called me. And Who would want to ever serve whatever God has called you to behave like this, to suggest shaming as an effective tool? I want to remind you this morning, stay away from NTCC. Stay away from New Testament Christian Church. This is the leader. This is the spirit of this place. And if you say you don't believe it, there you go again.
you're late to work, you'll be late to class, late to church, late to soul winning, late to eternity. You're being mean. Yes, I am. Toughen up. This world is not for lightweights. It's for people who buckle down and get some stamina and get patience and press on anyway. And if you can't do that, your ministry is not where you want to be. You're not going to make it in the ministry. Oh, my goodness. How many times can we hear this tired, old thing comparing Bible school to boot camp in the military? Are you kidding me? And because he does that, people think, oh, I really made it through Bible school. It, it's a boot camp. We have these crazy rules where uh, we're not allowed to do things that normal adults can. I think I shared before how that when I was in the Philippines and had expressed a desire to go to the Bible school, mostly because I was really <laughs> pressured about it, uh, a, a pastor and his wife that took over for the Ashmores, the Keys, they came over just fresh out of Bible school. And man, she just went on and on and on about how hard it was and only so few make it. And, and I was thinking, you know, I wasn't really sure what that meant. It wasn't until you get there. It doesn't matter if you sign a pledge you know, either in the first orientation or wherever, you have no idea the kind of control and of indoctrination that's going to happen that has nothing to do with the Bible. It doesn't prepare you for anything. And then what happens is you get yanked around when you go to a conference or or something. You hear all these people that had to stand up and be humiliated, shamed, by Davis because they weren't doing what they were supposed to do. What were they supposed to do? You didn't know. And if you went ahead and and allowed yourself to possibly be led by God for real, then your ideas were stupid because it didn't it didn't come forth from the man of God, the first man up before the throne of God. Am I upset? Yes, I am. I really am. There are people whose lives have absolutely been ruined and trashed and torn asunder by this group. People questioning, you know, what, what's what in life? Not only while they're in, but after they get out. It is such an unloving, uncaring environment. And I don't care if you get those little spurts of, Hi, sister. Hi. How are you? If you get a little praise the Lord hand in a Facebook post, who cares? Everybody that goes reads the Bible, right? They have to read that King James Bible. And, and we all read the words we saw what it said about what would Jesus do? How would he behave? That's not even the standard here. It's not the standard. Boot camp is the standard. Crazy. Has nothing to do with anything you're going to face when you get out there. At all. Not one thing. And you know why there, there were... Uh, ministers out there who were coercing their congregants to pay for their trips to conference and to pay for um, expensive birthday presents and anniversary gifts and give, 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 give your time. You go out, you sow in. We have other things to do. Yeah. And that is a lot of the preachers. It's a lot. It's a higher percentage than you care to know. And when we began to realize that, it's why it's one of the many reasons, there are doctrinal reasons like, like the forced tithing and all. I mean, the belief that a New 
Testament believers have to tithe at all. But when we began to see that there were all of these preachers and there were stories from church members about who had been in the military, so they'd had many preachers in NTCC. And that's why it's so important to keep the military away from these people because it's a building program. It's a corporation. They just want customers. You have to stay away. You have to listen to the words of this guy. And if you are happy with what you hear and all the clips I've shared, then you have to really question yourself about what what boundaries have you been led to? Like, okay, I won't cross that line. Then you cross that line. Well, but I won't cross this other line and do what they say. And then you cross that line. And pretty soon, you are a mom or a grandma or a dad or a son. And you are disowning your own children, your own parents, your own husband, your own wife. How do you get yourself to that place? How? How do you look upon your family members and close friends? No. No. You cross, you're crossing too many boundaries. They're drawing that line in the sand. They're figuring out who they can manipulate to what degree. And if you don't take the time to step back, when you see people in church being humiliated and shamed and called out for not ungodliness, because they're slouched in a class, are you kidding me? That guy is boring. He says the same thing over and over and over again. Those people are tired. The students are tired. Those men work all day long. They're trying to type notes. They're trying to get to class on time. So I want to hear this nonsense from him. If you're late to class, you'll be late for this. If you're late for work, you'll be late for that. He just, he is the fount of all knowledge and wisdom in that place. And how dare you not listen to him or believe that? It's all the same. It's all tired and old. There's people just hanging around up there in Graham. Ministers and their wives and their families. If this was an organization that was really about going out to all corners of the earth with the gospel... That would be premier. But we know from the leader, what's premier for him and his wife is the luxury life. They're living the luxury life. And you sit there and amen and take the tuck head. When he comes back from two weeks in a European vacation. And he has the audacity to call people out and say, Where's your dedication? You're a minister, but you might not be here tonight in Sunday night service. Good. I hope they're not. I hope they're spending time with their family or maybe they have to work another job so they have enough money to give the company to keep it afloat. Maybe they went to another church to visit. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? Let's, let's hear what else Mike has to dispense as far as wisdom. Because you can't make it with your feelings on your shoulders and being touchy and mad because you don't get your way. That's not Christian character. Christian character is like we had to be in the military. That's why Mike was just whining. Nobody helps me. The office workers, they're out of there right at 431 and nobody helps me. I want to be helped. I'm more tired than you. I'm more sick than you. Nobody helps me. He's upset when people don't amen him. He's upset when people don't look alert. He wears, 
he's the sensitive one. He wears all that on it. He doesn't just wear it on his sleeve. It's emblazoned across his chest in neon lights. He just says it. He, he doesn't even... He, he either doesn't care that he's a hypocrite or he's doing it on purpose to keep you in that weird state of flux that cult leaders like to do. So it's... I, he's, he's saying plainly, I'm on a two-week trip. You know he didn't go to church. He, didn't, he wasn't in church with the real brethren. Was he with fake brethren? Was he with the f fake Christians or with the Catholics or something? <laughs> or did he just not go because it wasn't important? What was important was visiting churches and then mocking them and mocking the people there when he came back. That was very important for the furtherance of the gospel because he cares so much about souls that are lost. He hardly, when do you even hear him talk about that? His feelings are hurt. He's angry because he's not obeyed and he is going to lash out and people are going to know. And he doesn't even care about the person that he's directing his anger towards. He cares about everyone else being in compliance. What did you do when that drill sergeant got in your face and called you every filthy name he could come up with? You just stared right through his skull like he wasn't there. As you'll see, he is going to make a correlation between boot camp and how people should be in Bible school. How they should be if Keckle reprimands them. They should just take it. Here, what is he saying then? He's, he's, they're going to beat you down and, and, and work you into the mold, into the, to the cookie cutter mold they want for the mission. What is the mission? It's not souls. They rarely talk about it. You never hear reports. And I, I keep saying this, but it's true. Let your ears be in tune, not just to what you're hearing, but to what you aren't hearing. And what you aren't hearing is what you're supposedly there for. Which, if it's a church member, you would think you're coming back to be fed, to grow, and to go out as well in whatever capacity you're able to. And in the Bible school, it should be, there's nothing about that school I cannot believe that it has changed much. It sounds like Keckle's still employing things like he, he, he said plainly not long ago about having that anti-communism book, teaching some kind of class about what to expect, what's coming up in the world. Why? It, it's so faithless. It's not even based on the Bible at all. So what are you being prepared for? You have to ask yourself these things. Even if you're afraid to ask them, you have to ask yourself and you have to come up with some real answers. Busy work is not preparing you for anything. You have to be brave. You have to ask the questions of yourself. You have to, you have to do that. You have to be able to let the truth in about what you're involved in here. And you told yourself, I don't care what he says, it doesn't affect me. I'm here, I'm gonna make it through this. I'm gonna keep my mouth shut, do what I'm supposed to do, and I'm gonna make it. And you know what, it was over after a few minutes. I don't do that to these students, but I feel like it sometimes. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? He's delusional. Now, what is wrong with you? We need that voice of correction. We need it. And we don't need to get our way. That's all you get in a cult. That's all you get. Correction. Like children. He said in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. I'm in chapter 10 now. As the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. 
How is it that assembling together with the church is not important to people? This is another way that cults twist the scriptures. It doesn't say, uh, don't forsake it six, seven times a week. It says, don't forsake it. That is it. It means don't forsake it. <laughs> there isn't a value placed on it. And there is no context within the New Testament, the KJV, where that is a thing. This is obscene, how they take this scripture and say, every time we decide to fling open these doors, you will be here, or your dedication is called into question. I've said that ad nauseum, but it has to be said, because that's not what that verse is. You're just accepting that he's saying it like that, to forsake it doesn't mean you don't come every single day. It doesn't mean you miss a service. That's not forsaking it. If you come once a week, that's not forsaking it. If you come once a month, that's not forsaking it. To forsake is to forsake. Pretty cut and dry. It just anything family comes up, they're gone. Anything uh, sports related or class related, they're gone. Two week European tour, they're gone. New house in Arizona, they have to go down and, you know, fix it up, they're gone. Anything comes up on Sunday, they're gone. And then they get an attitude if you say something about it. And then they start showing that attitude by their creation of distance. Cult leaders know because they're watching you all the time. You see, what he's saying here is someone someone figured him out that he's a hypocrite that he can do what he wants but you are not allowed you can't even take a day off if you want to go um boating if you just want to stay home and stare out the window at a leaf fluttering in the breeze in your backyard if you want to go work an extra day uh, whatever it is, you are not allowed. And see, yeah, you create distance because he realizes, oh, they're on to me. And they realize, and they're starting to think for themselves. And I can't have them thinking for themselves. Because if they start thinking for themselves, and if they start realizing they're grown adults and can do what they want, then others might get the same idea that they have free will too. They kind of slip out of the choir and they start pulling back and they come in at the last minute so they don't have to face the pastor and then they slip out. They go to the restroom during altar call and they slip out to their car to beat all the traffic, but that's not what they're running from. It's not the traffic they're running from. They're running from encounter. Yes, yes, they are. What a wise cult leader you are. Because you've seen it for decades and decades. That's right. They're tired of your confrontations. They're tired of walking through the, the line at the front door as they get looked up and down, up and down, down and up. They get pulled aside to have something said to them. They're tired of the humili humiliation. They're tired of it all. None of it makes sense. None of it's godly. None of it has anything to do with God or the Bible or anything they thought they were being called to. From accountability because of that bitterness that's in them, that grudge that they're nursing, they can't speak peaceably. Here is the king of the kingdom of can't speak peaceably himself calling someone else that. This is rich. This is so rich. Where is the conscience of this man? Where is it? Why wouldn't a Christian say, well, I have church at 1030 and I'll go after that. Because a Christian, 
a real one, realizes they have liberty in Christ. They do not have to be beholden to the tactics of a cult that requires them to be there all the time. That's why. I can't do that this day. I got church that day. We can't schedule our deluxe, beautiful, two-week European cruise, my darling, because we have church and we'll miss church. We'll miss two weeks of church. And how can I go back and ream those people and jack them up and bash them and rip them a new one if I'm out here having a good old time? You know what? We're just going to do it anyway. No one will dare say anything to us. And if they show any signs of irritation with me, I'm going to humiliate them beyond measure in class outside of class, in church. I'm going to go to all their friends, family. I'm going to tell everybody what an evil, evil devil they are. But it's the other way around. Well, if there's God, forget God. I got to go do this. I got a hockey game. Forget God. I have a two-week European cruise. I'm sorry. I don't understand that. I do not understand. That's the Lord's day. It's not my day. Then why did you go on a two-week European cruise? Why? Dude, man, you set the example for those people. How dare you come in and tell them they are not allowed to have even a day where they don't come in there? That is wicked. That is wicked. And it's just right out there in their face. And you're laughing all the way. You have people coming to pick you up from the airport. You don't even Uber home. You make the people who don't get to take two week European tours to come get you and bring you home. That's nasty. Number one, where does it say that in the Bible? You're making it sound like it's... It's the Sabbath for Jews, and they, this is the only thing you're allowed to do that day, is go to a church building and be in there with your wallet open and with your mouth shut until you're told to say amen or lift your hands or sing or um, gallop around like a prancing pony when you're told. You may miss something once in a while, but when you're all the time just throwing God down because you want to go do something, I don't understand. When you want to see the face of someone who is a manipulator, this is it. Look at it real good. He, do, he doesn't understand. I, I, I don't understand. My two-week European cruise was not the same thing. Though I missed a boatload of church, no pun intended. Does the Lord understand? That's between you and him. Sounds like it's between you and him as well. On a much larger scale, might I add.